Good morning. Welcome. I see a lot of familiar names. Thank you for coming back to our webinar series. And without further ado, I want to introduce our speaker today. Professor Gloria Gonzalez Morales will talk about how stressors can help you grow. And Professor Gonzalez Morales is the Associate Professor of Psychology at CGU and the Director of the Worker Wellbeing Lab. Her research includes occupational health and positive organizational psychology that focus on stress, work-life issues, victimization, and positive organizational interventions to enhance well-being and performance. Professor uh, has over 15 years of experience consulting for organizations in the US, Canada, and Europe. And with that, um, Professor, the floor is yours. We're so glad to have you here today. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here and to share uh, some of the learnings uh, of uh, during my career, both uh, doing research on work stress and also uh, doing consulting for a lot of organizations. Um, so the title of my talk is When Stressors Make You Grow. And in order to get to understanding when stressors make you were, uh, grow, uh, we're going to start with first uh, explaining what is work stress. Then we will um, figure out if stress is always negative or if there's a possibility for it to be a positive thing. Then we will get into when the stressors make you work and, and what does that mean. And then we will talk about how resources are the key to help people grow. So what is work stress? Okay, so um, I have been teaching a lot online just lately. Uh, so I'm able to have my slides and also look at the chat at the same time. I have developed disability finally. Um, so um, I will um, be looking at the at the chat in terms of you, if you have anything to say. You say that the camera is very shaky. I think it's because I'm moving. So I'm going to start to try not to move too much. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to ask you what is work stress, asking you specific questions, and you can answer in the chat if you want. So what are the stressful conditions that do you identify at work? What are the things that you feel that are stress, uh, stressors or sources of pressure? So for example, we have here uh, coming by Dilbert saying, well, I barely have time to avoid the work I already have. So that's like um, not having enough time to do all our tasks, for example. Yeah, work overload, exactly. Um, so think about what are the things that, you know, are things that are a source of pressure. Role conflict, angry customers. Oh yeah, those are hard to handle. Personal problems, deadlines, exactly. So all of those are what we call stressors in our, um, in, in when we are doing research. And everything have to be done right this second. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of stressors related to time and we would be talking about that a lot. Then what are things that indicate that you actually are stressed out? So when you realize that those things that you have put in the chat actually are stressing you out. So in this uh, PhD comic, um, I think this is Cecilia just feels like, you know, the, the computer is, is move where, moving towards your, you and eating your app. Um, adversarial and coworkers, that probably is a stressor when I'm seeing there. But how do you feel when you're stressed out? Like, so for example, for me, and I was talking, yeah, insomnia is one, heightened anxiety, being easily distracted, or feeling like you cannot deal with everything at the same time. I feel very, very overwhelmed, for example. Um, and there's people that actually feel the stress, like, oh, I feel overwhelmed and it, it just stays there. But there's other people that, you know, I saw that there was body tenses, eating disorders or, or insomnia that actually also just respond to the stress experience physically or psychologically, for example, yeah, not being able to sleep or yeah, clinch my jaw a few hours later is total pain. And that's a good um, um, combination of the previous slide, you know, you start feeling like, oh, I'm clinching my jaw, I'm getting stress, I'm getting tension. And then what your body experiences later is pain in, in, your, 
in your face. So you know that stress can actually have very negative consequences for your health. And then what do you do to deal with these experiences? Um, I love these uh, little graphic that says, well, I've learned to use meditation and relaxation to handle the stress, but just kidding, I'm on my third glass of wine. And those are two different ways of dealing with the stress and that's what we call coping. So uh, we can cope uh, with the feelings that the stress is giving us. Um, so you can do meditation, you can do relaxation so you don't feel that anxious. Or at the end of the day, you may want to try to recover by, you know, forgetting about work. And some people just, you know, um, use uh, wine or, but also other people just go to exercise and running. So those are emotion problem, emotion focused types of coping. But there's other types of coping. We can also, for example, try to think about how can we handle um, the problems that we have at work? How can we figure out better ways of uh, uh, trying to get along with employees uh, or with our coworkers? Or how can we do some um, um, time management in order to figure out all the workload that we have? And those are called problem-focused coping. A lot of the times problem focus doesn't work because the overload may be too big. So then we end up having to go back to that emotion focus, trying to deal with the anxiety that stress give us. So this is kind of like a summary of what I just said. So there's what we call a stressors or those things that you were saying that are uh, sources of pressure at work or even at home. Then we talk about the feelings that those stre stressors give us. So those are how, how do we feel when we feel stressed out or when something is stressful. And then uh, what we call distress is when we're talking more now about the health effects of being stressed out. So what we're going to be focusing on today is not so much on the consequences, but we're going to be focusing, uh, focusing on how the demands at work, so those stressors that we were talking about, actually are related uh, to how we feel about them. And that there's some kind of transaction between how we feel about all these and how these things pile up or happen, happen to us. And we're going to use um, this um, concept that is called cognitive appraisal. That means that when there's a demand in our life, like for example, too much workload, there's just a workload there. And some people may feel that is too much and have a cognitive appraisal of it being threatening and stressful. But some other, other people may think that that workload is, is good, that it keeps them focused, that it keeps them going. And they can, may see it as a, as a challenge to be able to get through, to learn and to, and to get better. And there's no right or wrong on how we feel about those demands because it's going to depend a lot on our own resources, what we can do about it, what are the resources around in the organization, in the city, uh, and, and how the demands are presented to us. And also it's going to depend on how well we are actually are able to cope or what are the resources that we have available to cope with it. So we're going to be focusing today a lot on all these issues. So, okay, so now we know what is work stress and that we can think about work stress in different ways as a source of pressure, as how do we feel about it or how our body responds to it or how do we cope with it. Now we're going to go to the next um, section where we're going to wonder if a stress is always negative. This idea that some people will perceive it or feel demands in different ways. So, um, when we talk about, for example, workload, I rarely have time to avoid the work I already have. Uh, we have items when we measure um, people's stress levels that get at, to that idea. For example, we ask people how stressful for them the number of projects uh, they have is, um, is, or the amount or scope of responsibility that they have. And usually uh, what we find is that People may find this stressful, but they also consider them an opportunity for personal development and achievement. Uh, so these are related to high performance, uh, high effective commitment to the organization, um, higher job satisfaction when you have this type of demands at work. 
There's other types of demands and that usually are, are, are obstacles. And these are, for example, the degree to which politics rather than performance affects organizational decisions. Um, you may be thinking that that may be one that you, you have to go through or a red tape or the lack of job security uh, that you have. And those are usually um, understood as obstacles to personal growth and task accomplishment. So you can see how certain demands are tend to be more opportunities and other demands tend to be obstacles. The question is, what if I'm good at politics and negotiation? I may thrive in an organization where there's a lot of political decisions and a lot of politics going on. Or what if I don't want to take on more responsibility? Maybe I have so much responsibility that that's hindering me because I don't have enough resources to deal with it. So the idea that certain demands are always one way or the other um, really um, is not a straightforward. It really has to go, uh, has to do with what we talk about, this idea of cognitive appraisal or perception and how it really depends on the transaction between what the demands is that we're going to call primary appraisal and what we can do about it that is a secondary appraisal. So I'm going to give you an example to understand all these, all these terms. So the primary appraisal is, is a demand, it's like workload or, um, or having a difficult customer or just having to deal with customers that can just be a demand. So our customer today is going to be a lion. Um, so when the lion is a cab and it's nice, uh, like when the customer is smiling to us, it may be irrelevant or even benign or positive. The problem is when we have an angry customer um, and that can be stressful because that's signaling us that there may be harm or loss or that there's a threat of harm or loss. For some people, an angry customer becomes a challenge and they're like, oh, you're lovely. Let me take a selfie with you to show how strong I am and resilient and how much you don't bother me. Um, so for, so you, you kind of make these assumptions of primary appraisal depending on how the demand is, how the customer is, how the lion looks like. But there's also the secondary appraisal. Imagine that you have this angry customer or this angry lion, but what can you do about it? If you're at the zoo, it actually is, is not that the harm and the loss is not there anymore. It's not even a challenge. It becomes benign or positive because you're just watching a beautiful creature behind bars. That for me actually is stressful because I don't like that. <laughs> but there is this thing about the interaction between what can be done and what it is, okay? So um, this idea about demands being opportunity for grow or obstacles um, against that, uh, that growth or, or against that uh, task or personal accomplishment is actually a question of appraisal or perception. The only thing that I would say right now is that don't leave the webinar right now because I don't want you to leave thinking that employees who are stressed out, that's a, pro that's a question of their perception and their appraisal and that they're stressed out because they want to, or you feeling guilty because thinking that, oh my God, I'm stressed out because I don't know how to deal with things and I cannot do anything about it and it's my fault. No, that's not what this talk is about. This talk is about understanding that for us to see things as opportunities, we have to be able to do something about them. We have to be able to have those bars at the zoo so, they, so the, um, uh, the lion doesn't attack us. We have to be able to have some kind of um, barrier for angry customers to not to get to us, okay? And those resources can be resources that we own and that we have or resources that the organization provide us so we can see those interactions as opportunities, okay? So I'm going to go now into this idea of what happens when stressors make you work, how stressors can actually make you work. Um, so I'm going to tell you like very briefly about a research um, that I did with my colleague Pedro Neves. He's actually an expert on, on trust. Um, he's at a business school in Lisbon. 
And uh, we actually decided that this idea of demands being perceptual, we should look into that. So for example, I, we gave them a lot of uh, questions, but for each question related to those demands or sources of pressure, we asked people to say, okay, so imagine that the question is uh, the scope of responsibility my position entails. We asked them, okay, so how much of these is an obstacle and how much of these do you perceive that is an opportunity? Okay, so we did that. And we, we kind of created these, um, um, what we call variables, where we try to relate one variable to each other. So we were looking at when people perceive that their jobs were basically, um, or were obstacles, uh, so they appraise them as obstacles, their demands in their jobs. Uh, we found that that was related to a lot of distress. We measured that with psychosomatic complaints. So a lot of the things that we were talking about, I see here, shallow red breathing, eating disorders, not being able to, uh, to sleep. And then what we found was that in this case, we had asked supervisors to rate these employees' uh, performance, both intra-role and extra-role. Intra-role means doing the tasks that are related uh, to, to your job. And extra role means going above, above and beyond what is required from your job. And it usually is related to, for example, what we call organizational citizenship behaviors. There are behaviors that help the functioning of the city or of the office or help other uh, colleagues um, and do their job. So what we found was that when people perceived that their demands were mainly obstacles, they had the reporting more, dis more distress and then their supervisors found that their performance was lower, uh, performance, uh, especially the intra role, but we didn't find a strong relationship for the extra role. And I think that the reason is because uh, most of our uh, participants in this study were women and women are expect, expected to do a lot of those extra role behaviors as part of their intra role um, um, job demands. So women are expected to be always helpful, to help other people do things, to, um, to show that they are good team players. And I think that that's the reason why, even when they were distressed, they still were doing these behaviors. Like distress wasn't affecting their ability uh, to be there above and beyond. Then we look at also opportunity appraisal at the same time. So when people were appraising and perceiving their demands as opportunities to grow, we found that they were, there was a very strong relationship with how committed they were to the organization. So that's what we call affective commitment. So how, how attached are they to the organization? They would like to stay and work for it. They would like to talk, they would talk to other people about how good the organization is. So this is an indicator of how they feel that the organization is giving them back as much as they're giving them. And that's what we call social exchange. So they feel good there. And when there's high effective commitment to the organization, when you're committed to the city, to the organization that you work for, uh, we found in our sample that there was a high increment in intra-role and extra-role performance in both. So in general, we found all these relationships. Also, we found that um, seeing things as opportunities was not related to being more distressed. Okay, so it, it didn't lead to having insomnia because you were you are you are dealing with the demands and you are growing and you are learning and you are getting excited. So you don't you don't have any distress issues. But when you see things as obstacles, not only you have distress, but also it lowers your effective commitment to the organization. You don't feel that the organization is doing as much for you that they're doing, that you're doing for them. You don't feel connected to the organization. And when that happens, then it's going to be affecting your performance. So the main ideas that I want you to stay with is that what we think are good stressors are not always perceived as opportunities. Sometimes what we found there is that all these stressors that are supposed to be good, like um, time, having, um, having a, a lot of projects or having a lot of responsibility, they're not always seen as opportunities to grow. 
And when we think about um, that perception of obstacles or opportunities, they have actually different effects, uh, effects on health attitudes and performance through these two mechanisms uh, that you saw there. So there's an induced distress through health issues that is negative. But when th people see things as opportunity, they feel motivated because there's this commitment to the organization. There's a social exchange between the employee and the organization that is positive. So people work um, more uh, with more engagement and, and, and more satisfied. So we have gone through all these three aspects. So what is work stress? Stress is not always negative. And what happens when the stress is negative or positive? Now, I think that the question that you probably are asking yourself is, okay, so how do we get people to see things as opportunities and not so much as obstacles? Um, so these are my questions then. Uh, what makes people see stressors as opportunities? How can we offer employees opportunities to grow and perform? Or how can we offer ourselves as, as employees opportunities to grow and perform? So the key, as I have been um, getting at all this time, is in the resources that we have available. So what are resources, first of all, and how they are related to stress? So there's a, there's a theory that I use a lot that is conservation of resources theory. That says that when you feel a stress is because there's a threat, a loss, or insufficient gain of tangible or intangible resources. Resources can be energies like time and stamina. And those not only are uh, tangible, but they're also finite. There's also conditions uh, that are not finite, like support, support, uh, having a supportive uh, supervisor or having a strong community. There's also objects. These are the resources that we work for. Uh, so having a house, having a car. And there's also personal characteristics, like having resilience or having knowledge to do your job. So all these resources are resources because they're valued by the individual or their means for, attain, for attaining those other resources. So I value having a nice house. And in order to get a nice house, I have to have enough time to work to get that house. So that theory that I'm telling you about, conservation of resources theory, for me it's like um, my, my spouse um, does uh, investment um, in, the, in, in the stock market. And every time I see him, like every, every morning he looks at it and he's like, oh my God, I'm, I'm losing money today. Or another day he's getting, he's getting money. I actually think about this theory uh, because I realize that it's really similar to investing in, in the stock market. What this theory says is that uh, individuals are motivated to always mitigate losses that they have. And, and to accrue gains to get resources to protect ourselves from future loss. Think about how you are putting money on your 401s to get money, uh, to get to have enough of a pool of resources for when you retire so you can use it because um, the, you, you're not going to have that, um, you're going to have a loss on income. And there's also resources spirals. And this idea of uh, initial losses that lead to future losses uh, so when you start in losing, you feel that you're going to be losing more. Um, and in, in investment, for example, when you start losing, they tell you to invest more instead of take out your money because uh, that will protect you from losing more. And that initial gains lead to future gains. Uh, so the more um, that you gain resources, the more resources that you have, the more resources that you will get. And actually, um, if we think about this in terms of what's happening right now, um, during the pandemic, all the inequities um, that had been brought up is really a question of resources. When you don't have resources to invest, it's very hard to gain them. So the social systemic inequalities that have ha that have happened for for decades are are showing how you know it's not as simple as uh, pulling you pulling yourself through your bootstraps. You actually have to have some resources to invest. And when you don't have them and you start losing, you lose and lose and lose. Um, so um, in in a study that we did in a in a big city in Texas, we found, for example, that. Uh, for people to see things as opportunities, not only they needed um, more um, tangible resources, like for example, um, having the right equipment to do their job or having enough time to do their jobs, but also the most opportunity appraisal came when they perceived that there was organizational support. 
meaning that um, the they felt that the organization care for the employee well-being and that value their contributions. So when people feel that way, feel that the organization support them and value them, they actually can see those demands that are put into them as, um, as opportunities. But not just because they see it, but also because they think that those tangible resources are going to be available to them if they need them. Um, so I think now we have established that resource investment leads to a loss. Uh, uh, when resource investment leads to a loss, people may feel that that demand is an obstacle because they're going to put all the time and they're not going to get anything out of it. They're just going to finish the task and that's it. And <clears throat> when people see demands as opportunities is because they feel that when they're investment, investing at resources, they're going to get a gain. Is that when you're in the stock market, you're like, I'm going to invest in Google because I know I'm, and that's going to go up uh, and it feels like an opportunity. But when you see a, um, a company that is losing and is going down, you probably wouldn't invest any money there because you would think that there's going to be a loss. So you would see that as an obstacle. Okay, so this is my model that I use a lot for consulting and for research. And it's this idea that resources will lead to different um, appraisals of demands. And then if you have an appraisal of obstacles, you would have less resources that will lead to more loss, um, burnout, health issues, lower performance. But when you see you have enough resources and you see things as opportunities, then you will increase your resources, you will increase your resource pool, and that will lead to growth, performance, and health. So what are organizational resources that we can use? For example, as I talk about tang tangible organizational resources, having the right equipment, having an equipment, not only computers, but for example, when you were talking about angry customers, having a way to, for you to not to have to deal with an, an angry customer, right? Um, um, for example, in the USPS, uh, no, yeah, in USPS, I usually see, um, um, Notice is saying like, we will not um, respond to uh, anger or incivil or harassing uh, comments, right? Like we will stop the service. You need a supervisor or management that allows you to put that notice to protect yourself. If your supervisor or, your, or the management or the policy doesn't protect that, then you don't have that tangible resources resource for you to deal with an angry customer, for example. There's also um, the ability of the organization to provide you with autonomy to do your work or to, for you to use any skills that you have to do it. There's, uh, we already talked about perceived organizational support. Uh, social support in the workplace is also an organizational resource and also having good leaders and having the ability to coach people. In terms of personal resources, uh, we also as individuals can do a lot of things. For example, uh, we, we have the idea that people who can put a lot of effort, consistency and focus are better at seeing things as opportunities. When they have control over the demand, it's more easy to see things as opportunities. When you have the knowledge and the skills to deal with the demand, then uh, you, you can see them as opportunities. And also there's other things that um, you can cultivate that are like, uh, I don't know if you have heard of positive capital, but this idea of being an optimistic, uh, having self-efficacy and also having positive coping styles. Um, those are things that can help you see things as opportunities. Um, so in terms of what to do and how can we offer employees opportunities to grow and perform. So think about what, happen, what happens at your jobs in terms of demands that are there and resources that you have. The demands, you can think about them as obstacles or opportunities and resources as personal resources and organizational resources. So for obstacles, everybody, employees, supervisors, managements could identify obstacles and obtain tangible resources to manage them. For example, you can reduce red tape. Like right here in at the CGU, um, they have allowed us to not to have to ask for permission to spend a specific um, amounts of money for research from 250 to 500. So now I have to do less red tape uh, or that policies are clear and they're not um, um, hidden somewhere. They are clearly uh, put there or that you can communicate with HR, for example, directly without having to go through a lot of intermediaries to figure out things that you need for your job. In terms of opportunities, um, 
you want to identify opportunities for employee growth and incorporate it in their jobs. And again, that can be done by the employee. They can, you can identify yourself what you can do to grow in your job, supervisors and management in general. For example, um, and then going back to the idea of gender, um, there's a lot of office housework that is uh, tasks that don't, don't lead to, they have to be done but they don't shine and, and they are not seen as something positive. For example, organizing birthday parties or being sure that the new employees are correctly onboarded. Um, all that office housework is usually done by women. And that's one of the reasons why it's very hard to get women in the higher, like being promoted because their resources are all invested on doing tasks that actually don't show, don't show off. Like they don't, they don't allow them to shine. Um, another way of thinking about this is um, think, rethinking performance reviews. We did with um, an organization, is a um, um, community health organization and a city in Canada. We reorganize performance in a different way because we know that annual performance reviews in, in uh, for-profit companies are based on the idea of incentives and bonuses. But when you're talking about non-for-profit organizations or, or cities where there's not a lot of incentives, um, you just do a performance re review every year for what? Um, so we actually decided that the performance review wouldn't be a performance review. It would be a developmental review during the whole year. So there's a document that supervisor and employee are maintaining is a, is a one um, a one drive document where the supervisor may may suggest to the employee, um, oh, there's this um, there's this training that you may want to do to do this task better or to to learn about these because there may be promotions line up where you may be able to apply if you have this training or for the employee to talk about successes and things that they have learned. Um, and it's not just a document. The idea is that you put in the document conversations that have happened over like every week, every month, every day. So we think about uh, a continuous uh, performance development, but not so much a review at the end of the year. And that is related to this idea of thinking about what are the resources that we have. So in terms of personal resources, organizations who cre should create the conditions for pe people to increase their personal resources, like provide opportunities for training so they have a skill development to be able to do well their, well their tasks. But the employee, for example, can do something that we call job crafting, that is crafting their job uh, as much as they can uh, to do um, a better, uh, to, to implement better their skills and the things that are meaningful for them. And I can talk about this a little bit later when we go into the questions that we did a great program with uh, about job crafting uh, with, um, with professors last year. And then at the organizational level, uh, we want, the organizational level is, is the role of supervisors and management mainly. We want the we want organizational and supervisory support the, because they are required to identify all these obstacles, to identify all the opportunities, and to provide helpful resources, as I was saying at the beginning. So actually, all, this table looks like it's all separate, but it it, it well it all interacts, right? When when management. Um, identify obstacles, they also have to provide uh, resources. So we have done with um, we an alliance of non for profit organizations in a county in, in Canada, we did a full need analysis to figure out what were the needs and what were the resources that every single organization had and how they could share those resources to create a community that was stronger. And again, this idea of the ongoing performance review can help you um, at the organizational level or the unit level uh, to understand what are the needs of the team, the department or the organization. So with this table and these ideas, I'm going to end um, the, <laughs> um, the talk. I know that you probably have a lot of questions. I already see one there. Um, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Professor. That was great. Um, you're talking Thank about, you. it's not just about a personal perception, seeing if a stressor is, is an opportunity to challenge 
or and that changes everything. But in fact, the organization can come around their employees to provide resources to change that perception so that uh, stressors can become opportunities to grow. Exactly. Uh, great. Yeah. Well, we got the our first question here. It says that uh, it says that do um, is in terms of generational gaps, you know, folks in different generations and in workplace, do they perceive stress differently? Stresses differently? Are they impacted the same? Um, for example, the older staff versus uh, the, the younger staff, someone who just started out. Uh, this is interesting because there's research that says that you know, generational differences are actually not generational differences per se, that there's nothing innerly that different from between generation Y and X and millennials and boomers. Uh, and that it's very hard to figure out if it's a question of just age, you know, different ages in the workplace. Um, but what I can say is that in relation to different generations, what you get is people with different sets of skills. Uh, and with different degrees of experience across organizations and within the organization. So obviously, uh, and that's why I think that is super important to think about this from a personali personalized perspective. And uh, Professor uh, Stephen Gilliland was talking about individualized consideration when, they, when we were doing the, the webinar about um, justice and what feels safe, uh, uh, fair, sorry. And it is kind of the same thing. Each person is going to bring uh, different personal resources. So when we talk about this part here, the personal resources, yes, different generations are going to have, let me just go here. Different generations are going to have different skills. So younger generations in the workplace I may be faster doing things in the computer because they are, you, or, or for example, it's not the same to ask someone who is at the end of their career, their tenure, they, their tenure in the organization has been for 30 years and they're 60 and they're told, oh, now you're going to manage all the social media. <laughs> and then ask uh, someone that, you know, is on their phone, on Instagram and on their own social media all the time. So of course that demand is going to feel very different to these two people, okay? But the person who is like, well, actually, that's that may be an opportunity they, they may not feel like because they may have uh, children or grandchildren that have been trying to teach them how to use social media so they may see like okay well i'm going to learn these if they for example they are paired with that younger person who is not afraid of social media and they may learn because they, the tenure person knows a lot about the organization knows a lot about what needs to be shared and what cannot be shared for example so there is a combination of the two of them that can work together to see both, and they both can see this opportunity, this as an opportunity. So an opportunity to grow, an opportunity to connect with their grandchildren that are on social media because they will learn how Twitter works and they will be able to follow them. So there's a lot of different ways that we can think about it in terms of how, yes, there are different personal resources, but they can be complementary if we can get people to talk to each other and figure out how can they complement each other and help each other. Great, great. Uh, the next question we have is, what if your supervisor is also too overloaded and stressed out to help you identify resources? And which uh, that ties into another question I've seen is that, uh, what, if, what if red tape is built into your organization? Yeah. Um, so yeah, this is a hard question because, uh, and, and, and it's true that right now in the middle of a pandemic, this has been even worse, right? Um, so I think that the idea would be go, to go step by step and little by little. We cannot implement something like this. Uh, identify opportunities, figure out things like suddenly like a huge program without figuring out first, how can we get people to recover from this stress and this burnout? We need to figure out ways to give people their resources to be able to, to just to stop and take a stock and being able to first build their personal resources in, ter in terms of energy, stam stamina, and health. Health is the most important resource that we have. 
So if we don't have that, yes, of course, it's going to be very hard for an employee to ask a, su a supervisor to support them. And that's why um, when I think about personal resources, about I, I put the three agents, employee, supervisor, and management. Because yes, management and supervisors have to help, but also the employee can figure out the conditions. And that's why we, was, we were talking about job crafting. You can craft your job. You can look for opportunities. You can even think about what are ways that you can also help your supervisor, right? Like this, I think now we have to stop thinking about things in terms of um, support comes top down and complaints come bottom up, <laughs> right? Like let's think about a more, more circular ways where we can um, have this social exchange, but not just social exchange, just building this social capital where there's reciprocity and that where we understand the needs and the demands of others and where are the resources that they have and what you can offer. Yeah, great, thank you. And the next question says that, how do we get support upward? We can get our personal resources going, but how do we middle management get the organizational buy-in? Um, yes, I think that it's going to depend a lot on the organization and where are the communication um, channels that you have and what is how much psychological safety and voice is, um, employees have to be able to communicate that upward. I think that building it slowly through supervisor support and then the supervisors going into management and trying to explain the need is one way. But I would say that um, a good consultant, for example, in that situation would be able to work top down because usually <laughs> some, a lot of organizations um, really um, <laughs> is, is, is sad, but they, they listen more to an external uh, agent than to an internal uh, person, right? Um, so, so any consultant that is um, that is helping with that should be very aware that the first step is to get the buy-in from the higher level. Great, thank you. Um, another question we have is how can we address the stigma against seeking help or expressing distress? I love that question. Um, so that's going to get me into my feminist um, uh, <laughs> rant. <laughs> um, so one of the issues with a lot of our organizations is that they're based on our, on, our, on our culture, right? Our national culture, our Western culture. And organizational culture is not immune to what happens outside. So most organizations have been built within the idea that Mm, we have uh, this competition performance is the most important aspect of what we're doing. There's this toxic uh, competitiveness, uh, this toxic contest culture that is kind of related to um, toxic masculinity values that we have had in our cultures for a long time. And they have been like, they, they are in the foundation of any organization. Uh, so that has created this idea that, you know, stamina is the most important thing, that resilience is the more important thing. And that's why I was saying at the, at, in the middle of the talk, wait, don't leave now. I'm not telling you that you have to be resilient and see every single stressor as an opportunity. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that for people to see things as opportunities, they need to have the resources to do so. So it has to, we have to create a, the conditions for people to be able to say, hey, I don't have the resources. Hey, this is too much. Can, if you want me to be successful, you have to support me. And, and this is the double edge of um, sword of uh, positive psychology. You know that at Claremont, we have a positive organizational psychology program. And it's very important that people don't think that with just meditation and mindfulness practice, you're going to have a healthy workforce you have to clean up your house uh, before you start putting plants on it. Or you have to clean up, like if you're doing going to, to grow vegetables in a garden, you're going to have to work on the soil first. The vegetables are not going to grow if your soil is dry and there's no water and it's not taken care of. So this is the same thing. If we don't change cultures into more positive cultures, more relational, you know what I was talking about, all these women doing the office housework and not being promoted because they're too busy doing that. 
it's not only about giving women other type of tasks. It's also about giving other people that usually don't do that housework and the opportunity to do that, right? The opportunity to create connections with each other, the opportunity of having um, um, high quality connections within the organization. So then, because we have a high quality connection where we are concerned by, by, with each other, we are helpful, helpful with each other, then we can ask for help. We can show that we're distressed. We can say, hey, this is not right. We don't need, we, I need help. I need resources. Maybe we need to use different language. And that's what I have done in another um, webinars where we talk about uh, specific for women. What is the language, language that you want to use when you ask for help? Don't ask for help or support. You say, you know, there's not enough resources available to um, implement this task efficiently. It's a totally different sentence. You're saying the same thing. Well, great. Thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> Let's see. Is there any, there's another question on the chat, I think. How we can help, how can we help this organization we are is less open to supporting people with high stress at the workplace? Um, there's um, there's no so this is similar to the same question that we had before about um, how do you get like a higher level buy-in? I think that pushing top uh, bottom up makes sense, but sometimes when there's no change in management and they are not willing to work on the soil to make people grow, so sometimes maybe you have to leave to other, another place where there's better soil. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Gonzalez Morales. Um, we're running out of time today. Oh, so yeah, that's true. This is, perfect. <laughs> this is a, a great time to, to end our presentation today. And would you change to the next slide, please? Uh, oh, yeah, of course. Sorry. And then again, one more, please. Uh, I would just want to talk about that uh, at CGU, we provide individualized consultant work for cities. And when working with different cities and water agencies to train um, to, to really uh, provide leadership development for usually a cohort of 20 or so. So uh, if you're interested, please contact me. And also we, uh, we have this on ground leadership development training that's week long that we're inviting you to join us as well. And if you're interested in the master's degree in leadership that's open to both the public and private sectors, it's one year program is hybrid, it's highly competitive. We would love to have you join us as well. So if any questions, please come and talk to me and uh, you receive my email, so please reach out. And with that, um, Professor uh, Gonzalez Morales, thank you so much for your presentation. And next week we'll come back uh, at 10 o'clock again on Tuesday, and it will be Professor Katharina Pick talking about building coalitions for future challenges. Thank you so much for your time today.